I'm a six figure Amazon seller who retail arbitrage only. I don't do any online arbitrage or wholesale. Among like all different Amazon business models, like why did you choose retail arbitrage? The reason I chose retail arbitrage was because... Uh, what was the process for finding your first yeah. product to sell on Amazon? The first book I found was basically using the app. Is there like any specific time of the year when they usually gonna have like some discounts or the better time like to go and do sourcing? You just find like these really big jackpots. How do you think can anyone make around like 5,000 US dollars a month on doing Amazon business? Hello ladies and gentlemen, today Bicol invited a very special Amazon seller who's only doing retail arbitrage. So today Alex will share with us how he's able to source for the products, why he chooses this business model for Amazon and other tips and strategies for Amazon sellers. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Alex on our channel. Hello Alex, how are you? Good, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure to have you here. And first, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. So my name is Alex Chung, and I'm a six-figure Amazon seller who retail arbitrage only. I don't do any online arbitrage or wholesale. And I'm from New Jersey originally, but currently I live in Georgia. And I started selling on Amazon in 2022. And in a little bit over one year, I generated over $375,000 in sales solely via retail arbitrage. And I started with zero dollars and zero credit. And a little bit of my backstory is I was studying entrepreneurship at Northeastern University in 2016. And I dropped out because I wanted to pursue my own business. And in college, they were just teaching theories and stuff like that. So ever since then, I've been on the hunt for a way to make money without working a job. And that's what led me to look for a different way and eventually find Amazon. And like, was Amazon business your first online business or you tried with something else first? I've actually tried many different business ideas. Uh, I've tried like eBay drop shipping, private label. But this was like the first one that I could really replace my income full time. So it was really good for me. Okay, that's good to hear. And then like, uh, how did you hear about Amazon business? Was it from YouTube or from your friends? Uh, so actually like the way I found out about this was actually from YouTube. So it was like during uh, 2020 and it was during like the whole like Pokemon card hype. Like, I saw like these videos on YouTube of people like buying these Pokemon cards from like Walmart. And then there's one guy who he was basically like loading his card up, but I saw that he was using like a, a phone app to scan the products. And basically that was an Amazon seller app. And he was basically checking the prices online and seeing like the differences in prices and how much profit he can make. And when I saw that, I was like completely mind, mind blown because I've heard about Amazon FBA before, but I thought you had to like import products from China and all that stuff. So I didn't know you can just go to Walmart and just buy products and then sell it on Amazon. So that's how I found out about it. Mm, and then like among like all different uh, Amazon business models, like why did you choose retail arbitrage? The reason I chose retail arbitrage was because uh, it's just something that I could just take action right away. Like I, I could just get out there and just start scanning items. And actually like the way that I first started selling was through um, selling used books. So the, basically the people that I was watching on YouTube they recommended that if you don't have much capital to start off by going to like thrift stores and stuff. And I use this app called Scout IQ and I had this barcode scanner and I would go to these thrift stores and like dollar store, uh, Goodwill and some library sales. And I would just scan all the books there. And that basically taught me how to uh, source inventory. And basically that carried over to going to retail stores is very similar. And it was just a natural progression into going to these stores and scanning products for Amazon. Okay, perfect. And then like, can I ask you like, what was the first item that you sold? I, I think it was book, right? And like, like how, like how, how was it to find the first product? Like, did you have to spend a lot of time? And like, what was the process for finding your first product yeah. to sell on Amazon? So, I mean, like the first, the first book I found was basically using the app. So it downloaded the entire Amazon book database onto my phone. So I just had to go to the store and basically I could just put my AirPods in and then the app will have a special ring if a book is profitable. So that's how I chose my first products because I would just scan every single book in the store, like even if it took me hours and I would just be there for hours on end um, scanning everything. And th that's how I found my first books and I would just buy anything that was profitable because at that time I had nothing to lose because like I had zero dollars. So all the money I made, I got it from Uber Eats. So I would just do like like four Uber Eats trips a day to make $40 and just go buy $40 of books. So I made a lot of mistakes, but I found some good products. But I was doing that for like about like one or two months. And then I got into retail arbitrage. And the first retail arbitrage product I found was actually at Walmart. And I found this 
like DC Batman action figure. And it was only $5. So when I found that product, I thought it was going to be a winner because on Amazon, it was going for like 15 bucks. But like when I bought it, it was only $5. And I didn't know about like Amazon fees and all that stuff. Mm. So it actually turned out to be a losing, pro- a losing product because it was like over one pound. It's kind of heavy. But that was still a, le- a lesson that I learned from that. So that's the first product I found. Yeah, right. And then like what was some of, some of the mistakes that you did at the beginning of your journey? In terms of mistakes, like, I, don't really, I don't like to consider them mistakes because they're all like learning opportunities. But mm-hmm. I did purchase some items with like really high ranks because I didn't know. So when I first started, I would, I would buy uh, items that had like up to like one or two million rank, which is just like crazy. Oh, wow. But, but yeah. like, they were books though. So they did sell. I, I was able to get rid of all of them. But lately, I just I try to store stuff under like 10K if possible, but just like faster selling items. And also another mistake is just using like these really like cheap repricers and th- they would like just tank my listings. And I couldn't set like the minimum prices on each listing one by one because it was just like a one rule for all my listings. So that was oh, a mistake. I mean, mm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was kind of like um, not really advanced <laughs> and yeah, it's kind of affecting yeah. your sales as well. But then like, can I ask you like uh, for the yeah. retail arbitrage, like what do you think is the main benefits of this business model? So in terms of, uh, for especially for beginners, I think it's like a great way to get into it because like you're very motivated to like keep doing it when you can like experience daily wins because like for instance, like with online arbitrage, you might be on the computer and you might not find anything. But with retail arbitrage, you can go to these stores and you can get stuff that same day and then start selling it right off the bat. So I believe that's really good for beginners. And personally, for me, the reason why I like retail arbitrage is it's just very consistent. And I know that I can go to any store, any any place in the country and find profitable inventory. And then a lot of times I can just sell it right away, like even out of my trunk as opposed to having to wait for it to come into the mail. Mm, right, right. And then like, can I ask you like, uh, for you, like when you do the product sourcing for the retail arbitrage, like uh, like how did you learn about this product sourcing? Like, and uh, was there like any yeah. difficulties at the beginning or some things that you didn't know at the first and then you learned with the time? Yeah, uh, so, so basically the way I learned was actually like through YouTube pretty much. But I would watch these like live streams of people who were like in store, like they would go to like Walmart, Target and stuff like that. And then also I would, le- I would watch some like online arbitrage sourcing videos as well, because it's, it's pretty much the same thing in terms of analyzing the data. So I would, I would watch that to learn how to analyze like the sales rank, estimated sales, like read the Keepa charts and all that stuff. But the way I learned retail arbitrage was whenever I watched those videos, I would just go right, right away to the store and I would look for that same item. But I wouldn't just copy these people like blindly. Like I would rescan the items to see, like try to understand like w- why I was a winner, try to see how much profit there was in there, like how fast it sells. Like just try to understand. And if I was gated, I would try to request for approval. But basically, I just learned from taking action. And another thing is, say that the product wasn't a winner, I would also like look around like the similar sections, like the clearance sections. I would just scan everything there and just take massive action, just trying to like immerse myself any way I could like learn from experience. And you just like mentioned about ungating. So can you tell us more about ungating? Like how was it for yeah, you at the for beginning? Sure. And is there like any tips you can give to people for the ungating part? Yeah, of course. The way I learned how to get ungated was also from YouTube. Like everything's on YouTube nowadays. But what I would do is I would just search up like how to get ungated in Nike, these kind of things on YouTube and I would just follow their step-by-step guides. And what I would do is use invoices from stores like Kohl's, East Bay, Price Master, any kind of like distributor. And basically I would uh, purchase like 10 units of the product, get it shipped to my house, take pictures and submit it. But eventually I realized that like more important than like where you get it from, it just matters that like you submit the right kind of documentation. So I began to do like trial and error, just try out like different kind of suppliers and also I would do a lot of research on Google, just trying to see other people's experiences, trying to see what worked for other people. And then if it worked for them, I would try it out. And also like, I would just try out any kind of documentation I had, I would just try submitting it. So for instance, uh, one time I got ungated in Squishmallows with a in-store order confirmation slip. And I didn't think it would work. I just gave it a shot and it actually ended up working. 
another thing I would do is I would uh, sit, I would sit on my computer in my house and I would just look around my house for like any kind of products I had. Like for instance, like, like this, like vitamin right here. Like I would just mm. like, go, go on like the catalog and just type in the, all these brand names of products I had around my house. And one by one, I would just try to request for approval, like apply. And then a lot of the times I would get engaged. And I actually compiled like this list of like 350 brands that auto engage sellers, even if you have like no sales. And it's on my website, mkbln.com. But that's that's a great way to get engaged is just to try to get auto engaged because you don't have to spend any money. And as your sales keep increasing, you can get engaged in more and more brands. Right. So like once you start to sell on Amazon and generate some sales, it's getting easier and easier to get engaged, right? Exactly. Yeah. And at a certain point, like I, I just realized that they just engaged me in like all kinds of brands that previously they denied me for, like without having to send mm. invo invoices, just just from having good sales. Okay, that's good to hear. And then like yeah. now I want to ask you like how do you think is the what do you what do you think is the best way to scale up like by doing retail arbitrage? Because for example, when people yeah. do OA, they're gonna hire some VAs to help them to scale up. But how is it like for retail arbitrage? How can you scale up doing retail arbitrage? Yeah. So like a great way to scale is um, so basically like the, the, the first thing I would do is just basically reinvest all your profits. Like I wouldn't take out any money for at least like maybe a year or so just so you can keep growing and growing your inventory. And I'd also do some merchant fulfilling as well. So I have like more and more inventory uh, available. Another thing I would do is look into utilizing like credit, but only once you're like consistent in your profitability because with retail arbitrage, is like much higher ROI than online arbitrage. So like the more credit you have, you can buy more. So if you go to like Costco, you find like a whole pallet, you could buy the whole thing, you know, and that could last you for like a while. So mm. I would experiment with like, um, like credit, but only once you're like very confident and very consistent in your profits. And you can use stuff like credit cards, uh, business lines of credit, and then like Amazon loans. Like if you have high sales, they'll start to offer you these loans that you can utilize. And a way that I've scaled personally recently is is by investing in space. So when I first started off, I started off in like my room and eventually I had to move into the garage like because I had too much stuff. And now I'm, I'm working out of uh, two storage units and I basically converted it into a warehouse. So I have one of them has power and the other one is mainly for storage and I can do like FBA shipments in there. Uh, I can stock my merchant fulfilled inventory and also ship out like orders. So basically the, the great way to scale would, would be to just keep reinvesting and then just grow naturally. Because eventually if you have enough capital, you can also get warehouses, get employees and stuff like that. And uh, I haven't gotten to the point where I had to train another person, but that's also a possibility in the future. You can teach someone else how to source with you. And um, if you go to places like Nike outlet, there's like limits of like like 30. You can also like bring more people with you. So that's another way you can like scale and like multiply. But the main things would be just reinvesting, you know, trying out some credit stuff and then investing in more space as you grow. Yeah, that's great to hear. Thank you for sharing these tips. And do you usually yeah. go out of to other cities that are close to you, like to source for the products or it's pretty much enough like of different stores in your in your own city? So like where I live, there's a lot of stores. So I don't necessarily have to go out of my like own region because they're always like stocking new stuff like every single day. It's, it's actually like a lot more inventory out, th like, out there. Like once you get engaged in, in a lot of brands, there's tons of stuff. But I do travel. Like I'm willing to travel to different towns. Um, like I do travel quite frequently. And I find that different towns tend to have like a lot better stuff sometimes, especially if there's no like resellers in that area. It can be like a complete gold mine. There'll be times where I just load up my car like to the brim. I have no room left. But I do a lot of Nike outlet. So I go to like pretty much every different Nike outlet that's located near me. So there's about like like four uh, lo located near me. So I'll I'll switch up. Sometimes I go to like two in a day, you know. So yeah. Okay, that's good. And then like, what are your favorite stores to go to look for the products? So I like Nike outlet for sure. And I like Marshalls, TJ Maxx, Ross, Burlington, Costco, Sam's Club. Those are good. And um, like pretty much anywhere, like I, I can even find products at Walgreens and stuff like that. But just anywhere that they have clearance, I, I'm, I'm down to scan it. But 
the, the most profitable ones for me probably are like Marshalls, Ross, and Nike Outlet. And then like, let's say like when you come to that store, like what is the first thing you will do? Like, and how does it work that you come to the store and are you gonna go like to the clearance section or are you just gonna go like to different, uh, or, like to other sections and try to find the products? Like, can you share about like the way yeah, you usually yeah. source? Yeah, so I mean, it, it depends on the store. So like, for instance, if I'm going to like, a discount store like Marshalls or like TJ Maxx, I kind of know like what sections like have good products. Like, me personally, I like to sell a lot of toys and stuff and clothes. So I might just scan like the whole like like clothes rack or like the whole toy section uh, or like I might do like the grocery section. Sometimes I'll do like the clearance beauty. But like when I first started off, I would do only clearance because I was like low on capital. But lately I do a lot of full price stuff at those stores. Yeah, there tends to be a lot of good new stuff coming in. But I just I just go like scan everything pretty much. But if it was like a store like Costco or Sam's Club, I'll tend to look for with the clearance tag because once you find a clearance deal you can buy as many as you want so that tends to be very profitable and if i'm going to nike outlet i like to look for the items that have like that end in like nine seven because that's a clearance price and then the ones that have like additional 30 percent on top of that and those tend to be like the ser- like really discounted goods so and also the the clothing clearance racks those tend to have a lot of good profit in there and is there like any specific time of the year or like any specific season then when they usually gonna have like some discounts or the better time like to go and do sourcing? Uh, for like which stores, like any store or like- Yeah, for any store. Any store? Um, mm. I mean, like they're, they're always doing clearance like all the time, but obviously there are certain periods of time that different categories would be on clearance. Like for instance, like after Christmas, that would be a great time to get like toys and stuff because everything goes on clearance because they don't want it anymore, like all the holiday stuff. And then for Nike, uh, they just change it like every week. Like sometimes they don't have that good stuff. But other times they'll be doing like massive clearance sale. So this consistency is key. Like if you keep showing up, you, you just find like these really big jackpots. And like for me, for me personally, I don't, I don't um, try to like find like the best. I don't like, I'm not part of any groups. I just, I just show up all the time and then I just find it but I'm always able to find good deals and there's always good stuff going on sale. Okay, perfect. And then like, did it ever happen that you go to do your product sourcing and then you meet like another Amazon seller like in the store also trying to find some products? Yeah, it happens like pretty frequently actually. Oh, okay, that's cool. um, Yeah. (laughs) And like sometimes people, you know, they look at your cart and it's like full to the brim and they think you're crazy and stuff like that. Or people think you're like drop shipping or something. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've seen other, I've seen plenty of other Amazon sellers out there, but like not okay. that many though. Like the, the competition is not that crazy. Like there's only like a few people who do it in my area at least. Mm. And yeah, this is cool. And like now I want to ask you about uh, the tax free. Like how do you usually yeah. purchase retail arbitrage tax free at outlets or yeah. at chain stores? Uh, okay, so um, so it only works at like certain stores. So what you have to do is you have to get like a reseller certificate from your state. And depending on where you live, you may need like a LLC for that. Like in my state, you don't need an LLC. But uh, once you get your LLC or like if you don't need one, like you can just sign up with your state. So you just go on Google and search up sales and use tax. And then you just sign up for the reseller certificate. And then uh, you, you can just get it. It's, it doesn't cost any money. And once you get it, you can bring it to the stores. So for instance, if I'm going to like Marshalls or TJ Maxx or Home Goods, I just hand them my reseller certificate and then they'll know what to do. And same thing with Nike. And other stores such as like uh, Sam's Club and Costco, you have to give it to them when you sign up. And then there's also stores that don't accept it at all. For instance, like Target and, and Ross. So just depending on the store, I may or may not use it, but I mainly use it at most of the stores I personally shop at. And like how much usually does it help you to save when you use this certificate? If, if I'm selling, well, the thing is like, if I'm at Nike, I tend to spend like a lot at once because I always buy the maximum amount. So it can be like 50 or $60 of taxes because I might be spending like $800. Mm. So it can add up. Yeah. But even, but even if you don't use a tax exempt, you can get that money back later because it's tax deductible. So it's not really a problem either way. 
Right, right. Okay, that's good to hear. And then, like, yeah. what do you think, like, Amazon sellers should do, like, in Q1 or Q2? Because it's less busy seasons. And is there, like, yeah. any specific um, things they can do, like, in those less busy seasons? Yeah, so, like, during those seasons, um, I, I think it's best to focus on products that people buy year-round, such as, like, household goods, health and beauty products, grocery products. And also, it's a good time to sell, you know, like meltable goods, such as like chocolates and candies, because during the summer, you can't sell that stuff. But like during Q1 and Q2, you have like Valentine's Day and people love meltable products. They have really good profit margins. And in general, I would just stay away from selling toys and stuff like that. Sell more like essential goods. But Q1 and Q2 is definitely a good time to load up on, on toy deals because that's when they're going to go on clearance because there's no demand for that stuff. But overall, just I would recommend just continuing to reinvest your your money into more inventory and then just like continuing to grow. Okay, awesome. And then like I want to ask you, Alex, like how do you think can anyone make around like five thousand US dollars a month on doing Amazon business? If you want to make like five thousand or even like ten thousand a month, like I recommend you get into like a great way to do it would be going to the Nike outlet, which is what I personally do right now. I go almost every single day because my storage unit is only six minutes away from Nike outlet. So what I would do is first get ungated in Nike, which you can do by going on my website and reading my ungating guide. Like I teach you how to do it step by step. That's mkvln.com. So first get ungated in Nike and then you can start selling it. So then go to the Nike outlet every single day and purchase the maximum quantity. So I recommend you purchase uh, 30 units a day because they let you buy six different styles and then five of each style. So that, that applies to like shoes, clothes, backpacks, any anything. So buy 30 units and use a app like Selleramp to scan products and find the profitable ones and then buy them and bring them home. And then I would do it all FBA. So create an FBA shipment using a product like Inventory Lab or Amazon um, Amazon Seller Central. And then create an uh, create a FBA shipment and then send your products to Amazon. And then I would recommend you use Be Cool. So use the $25 a month rule-based plan because it's the cheapest one. And just use like a match buy box plan because for Nike shoes, you don't have to do any kind of crazy repricing. All you have to do is just match the buy box. Amazon will rotate you in and then once you start making some good money, eventually upgrade over to the AI plan because then you can start making even more sales. But in general, just try to go there every single day. And then if you, if you don't have a Nike near you, you can also do retail arbitrage mainly. So in that case, I would download my auto and gate ASINs list and apply to like every single brand on the list. So 350 brands, just go into your catalog and type in each brand one by one. And then wh whichever brand you get approved for, I would just write it down on a piece of paper or on your phone. And then start going to stores like TJ Maxx, Marshalls, Home Goods, Sam's Club, um, Ross, Burlington, just any of these stores and just look for those brands and start scanning 100 items every single day. And then once you find profitable inventory, just load it up into your cart and then just buy it and bring it home. And same thing, create a shipment for FBA and then send it off and then use Be Cool to reprice. So that's what I would do. It's like one of those two. But personally, I do everything. I do Nike outlet and then I might hit like Marshalls after. I just like to mix it up. So I have a good uh, good uh, inventory mix, you know. Yeah, those are great, great tips. Thank you for sharing that, Alex. Yeah. And I want to ask you like, for, when you do the product sourcing, like do you usually like set a limit or maybe like some sort of like time limit that you need to do the, your sourcing, maybe like five hours a day, or you maybe like said, like, as you said, like you need to at least scan like a hundred items per day. Do you usually put those kind of like, uh, like goals for yourself? Like when you do the product sourcing? Um, so like, I recommend other people scan 100 items a day, but personally, I don't really keep track. I just do it all day. All day? Like, oh. Yeah, I mean, well, like, I like to go hard because I'm trying to grow like aggressively. So I don't really care like how many hours I work, but my goal is just to spend all my money. Like I like to just like go crazy, buy as much profitable inventory as I can, just sell it, like turn my money as fast as possible. Because like the more times you turn your money, the, the more like you grow. So my goal is always to try to spend all my money, but it's getting harder and harder because like 
when I first started off, I'll run out of money. And yeah. <laughs> as I grow, yeah, like as I grow my credit and grow my capital, because it keeps growing exponentially. So it gets harder and harder. So I just try to go until I run out of energy. And I'll spend like certain days, like I tend to source during the week because that's when no one's really out. It's less busy. And then during the weekend, I'll do more like shipping, creating shipments because it's too busy on those days. That's how I personally do it. But I don't like to set limits. I like to just go until I'm satisfied. Mm, yeah, that's perfect. And then like, Alex, <laughs> can you tell us uh, when did you start to use a repricer? Yeah, yeah, of course. So um, in terms of the repricer, I just used that like starting off right off the bat. I used uh, the cheapest one I could find. So it was called like Reprice It. It's only 10 bucks, but I don't recommend it because it just it would just do the same rule for all, like it would use the same rule for all my listings and you couldn't set your minimum maximum prices for each listing individually so the problem with that was like a lot of listings would just tank completely and like i would lose money on a lot of stuff like even though it, it had a lot of sales like there was a lot of times when i would just lose money completely and the way that that repricer worked was it would just undercut everyone else by like a penny so that was just a problem because like you don't want to do that you want to match the buy box that's how you get more sales and like hold the price but after like like one or two months i switched over to be cool and i've been using that and it's been working pretty good okay that's perfect and then like can you tell us like how do you usually reprice in the busy season such as q4 yeah yeah during q4 i like to i like to focus on profit maximizing ai so i, I like to maximize my profit because the demand is already there and I don't like to lower my prices if I don't have to especially if people are like lining up to buy like during the holiday season so during Q4 I'll go for all the money so I'll use like the most conservative repricing strategy and I'll only lower the sales like, like lower my repricing strategy to increase sales if an item is not selling or if it's like an old inventory but for the most part I'll stick with profit maximizing AI and then like when it comes to the less busy seasons such as q1 or q2 like how do you usually reprice in those seasons so during q1 i'm more inclined to use like a sales booster or a sales maximizer because like if the demand is not there i want to drive sales and turn my inventory and get capital back so i can buy more stuff and i'm not really concerned about getting all the profit and that that's why like if it's less busy i'll just focus on as much sales as possible Okay, that's good to hear. And then like, can you tell us like, how do you think is like, what do you think is the best way to win Amazon buy box? Yeah, so the best way to win the buy box is to source good inventory that has a consistent buy box and make sure that you can, so you can um, make sure you can easily match the buy box price. So I would focus on fast selling inventory. And on top of that, I would make sure that you check Keepa to make sure that Amazon shares the buy box. And you can also use a repricer to make sure that you're always like in that range. So set the minimum maximum price at a good level and then just let it match your buy box for you. And then like, uh, how do you usually pick your repricing rules? So I generally always start off with the most conservative repricing plan. And I also like to set my prices high when I first create my listings. And this is something that I learned from like when I used to work at car dealerships is that you always want to start negotiations high and especially with repricing because you don't like if you start off low you don't know if the item can sell for more but if you start off high and it sells then you don't have to lower it and then if it doesn't sell then you can lower your prices and become more aggressive but i always start off with ai max profit and the way that i actually uh, go about doing this is i use conditional repricing so i use the inventory age conditions to make sure that like if, if my inventory is fresh, I'm going to use the, the most conservative repressing plan. And then the, the older it gets, I start to use sales maximizer or like sales booster so I can get more sales. But I always start off like high price and conservative repressing. Yeah, I think it's actually a good way. And then like yeah. uh, uh, this way you actually can automatically switch to different rules. So you don't need to go and manually like switch it over the time so yeah i think it's the best yeah. way to use the conditional repricing and i want to ask you alex do you still see yourself selling on amazon like in five or even like 10 years yeah so like i've been interested in reselling for probably about 10 years now i mean i started my ebay account in 2013 but obviously it wasn't until recently that i started to make money 
like full-time income doing it so i don't see myself doing this just like as a get rich quick thing like i've always been interested in like the whole idea of starting a business like selling stuff it would be my passion so i do see myself doing it in the next five to ten years and i want to get into like the wholesale route so my plan is to continue to increase my capital get more credit and just build my business and just grow like that Okay, perfect. And then like Alex, I want to ask you like, if someone wants to find you on social media, like where should they go and follow you? Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram. My username is mkvln underscore. You can find me on TikTok, which is under, underscore mkvln. And then on YouTube, mkvln. And finally, you can find me on my website, which is mkvln.com. And it's a blog that teaches you how to sell on Amazon for free and has info that other people might charge money for. I teach everything from getting on gated, how to start your Amazon account, how to create your shipments, and everything is available on there. Okay, perfect. We're going to make sure to include those links in the description. So guys, go and make sure to follow Alex on his social media. And yeah, we're getting to the end of our video. Thank you so much, Alex, for sharing like all the tips and strategies and like your personal experience doing retail arbitrage. I think it was great. Yeah, so thank you again. And uh, I guess we'll see you me. next time. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay, so see you, Alex. All right, see you. Bye.